tonight on Recruits. Out of the classroom and onto the streets. Look after my mum, you idiot. Look after my mum. It's first week on road for the brand new paramedics. I'm thinking, oh my God. It's crunch time for trainee paramedic Blake. He's already failed part of his practical assessment. Eight weeks training could be down the drain. It was the last chance really that I had to get this right and to be able to walk out of here with a uniform on my back. He needs to correctly apply a box splint. The splint uh, done the job, so we'll sign you off on that one. So I'll just, um... thanks Blake, well done. Yeah, it puts a smile on your face, knowing that you're done and in less than, less than five days, I'll be working my first night shift in, uh, in Coffs Harbour. Blake can now join his classmates on graduation day. All right. This is it. Who would have thought? You know, eight weeks and we've all come this far and we're paramedics now, you know? I mean, even just being called that title, I think, is, is an honour. Exciting putting on, you know, the, the big official uniform. So what we've been waiting for. Trainee paramedic Rainer Potter. <laughs> Trainee paramedic Blake Field. <laughs> Trainee paramedic Danielle Stronek. The new recruits will now embark on the final stage of training, a three-year mentorship on the road. This is something special, and I mean, I haven't even gone out in the street yet, and I already think it's the best job in the world. Rainer was class clown at college, but has he got the aptitude to cut it on the streets? Morning. You must be Rainer. Welcome. Thank you. Nice How to meet going? you. Oh, very well. It's crazy, you know. Only a few weeks ago we were in the college, the College of Knowledge, and um, and now we're out here, we're really doing it. It's a huge thing that Rain is doing at the moment to come out of Roselle and here on his first day on the road. He'll be nervous, and, and that's a good thing because I think that, that keeps a bit of awareness about him. Rainer's mentor is six-year veteran Mel. The team will be based at Concord in the heart of Sydney's west. It's one of the busiest beats in the country. I was in nursing before this, but I still come into this job thinking, goodness me, what have I done? I just hope I can contribute, you know, positively to the team and just do a good job in general. It's raining, we'll get this gear out. Yeah. Rainer's first night check tonight and it looks like we have uh, could have an interesting one. We've got the rain happening. We've got a Saturday night and uh, apparently it's a uh, very full moon. So uh, who knows what the night may bring. So uh, we'll see how Rainer copes. I hope I don't fall asleep. 9.30 p.m. Their first call comes through. 18-year-old male who is conscious and breathing, unknown status, third-party caller, overdose, drug affected. A drug overdose is Rainer's first official job as a paramedic. Overdoses are notoriously unpredictable. The 18-year-old teenager texted his mother with an alarming message. He was dying. He then collapsed near his home. His mother has just arrived at the scene. Very chaotic scene here at the moment. As you saw, the mother um, just pulled up in a car and ran straight out into the oncoming traffic to get to her son. All that is very distracting to Rainer at this level, so he's really got to concentrate. Do you guys know what it might be? Okay. He's also on antidepressants. I think it's Lovin. So whether he's had a reaction or if it's pills, I don't know. What's happening? I'm, I'm never left. Just tell you. I'm, I'm alright. I'm alright. I'm alright. Okay. I'm all right. Okay. Cool.
Rainer makes his first real assessment. Take a big deep breath for me, man. Look, I'm coming and going, I'm coming and going. So what have you had? What do you think you've had? Weird, I'm not just going. He's very anxious, he's very uptight. His heart rate's racing quite long at about 120 beats a minute. So we'll have a look at that and see if we can maybe find out what's at the bottom of it. Listen, matey, look at me. How come you're here tonight on the wet ground? I smoke drugs. You smoke drugs? What sort of drugs did you smoke? Marijuana. Just marijuana? Yeah. Okay, how much did you have? A lot. Okay, how often do you smoke marijuana? Never. If the teenager has only taken marijuana, his reaction is unusually severe. Yeah. Have you taken anything else tonight? I don't think so. No other drugs? No. You couldn't possibly have been given something by someone else? I don't know. That's okay. I've just got to make sure that he's conscious, he knows what's going on. We've got to keep him alert and get him down to the hospital pretty quick. To make the situation worse, the teenager's mother may soon need medical attention herself. My mum, sus, sus. Look after my mum, you idiot. Look after my mum. An idiot, look after my mum, use your brain, don't worry about me, if I die, I die. He's got plenty to say, he's pretty cranky, um, he's doing okay. Rainer suspects there is something else at play. The patient had told us that he'd taken marijuana, but then he had a high heart rate, so that indicates that, that he's taken some sort of amphetamine or something else. What am I going to do? I'm going to take blood pressure again? Hey, hey, don't you fall asleep on me? Hey! Hey! I swear, I was praying to God if I survive this and get safe in safe people's hands. Oh, well, you are now, mate. Muslim, if I die. Rainer can do little more than monitor his vital signs and lend a sympathetic ear. But God, and there's one moment where I really feel like my, my soul is taken out. Never again, no smoking, no drugs. Where are we now? Concord. Hospital? Yeah. You want to have an operation? Oh, I don't know, mate. I'm finding it a little bit hard to judge exactly what's going on at this time. So um, some blood work and a few simple little tests will fix that very easily. As the drugs work through his system, the teenager is now in safe hands. But will he be safe from his mother? His mother was also assessed as suffering shock. The patient might not always tell you the truth because they're worried about getting in trouble. You've just really got to emphasise to them that we can't help them if, if they're not forthcoming. Rain is a great communicator. He really, really talks with the patients well, has a, a, a good bedside manner, and that will stand him in really good stead. On the north coast of New South Wales, it's Blake's first week as a paramedic trainee. Coffs is a really good town. It's, it's quite a lot like home, but uh, but bigger. It's got that good country vibe. It's, uh, it's a good town to live in. So this is on the northern end of Coffs Harbour. Paul uh, is my mentor and Paul's a uh, pretty keen surfer, so we get along really well. The hardest trouble I've had with Blake is keeping the girls. They're all chasing us around the hospital. Who's the new guy? I think Blake's a bit of a spunk. So I've lost me, uh, me title a bit to the young fella, but that's it. This job is going to be really challenging. I, I signed up believing that I can do it, and I know that if I do my best, hopefully that will be enough to get me through my traineeship on to becoming a paramedic. The coastal town moves at a slower pace, but Blake is about to discover it's no place to relax. 70-year-old male, unconscious, not breathing. Patient can't be woken, lips, nose, blue. With mentor Paul, they race to a paramedic's most urgent call. A man is unconscious and not breathing. Every second counts. It's Blake's first week as a trainee paramedic. With mentor Paul, they race to a code one. Paramedic's most urgent call. A man is unconscious and not breathing. The patient is Frankie, a pensioner and long-time Coffs Harbour local. Okay, mate, here you go. His friend Gary found him slumped in his chair. Inside, Frankie appears asleep in front of the television. But Frankie is long past help. When I first touched him, it was quite, quite cold, and I must admit that that feeling hung around on my, on my finger and my thumb for perhaps even now still. Still feels a bit, a bit funny. At this point, there's nothing we can do for him, so we just need to check on the bystander that found him. Yeah. So we'll yeah. just make sure he's okay and that everything's good with him. Yeah. 
Did you have any sort of medical history on this? With child? a long-standing heart condition, Frankie appears to have died peacefully in his sleep. As a sudden death, it will be referred to the coroner. So this gentleman, uh, he's been found by his, his friend who could see him through the window an hour ago, he thought he was sleeping. At this point, really, it's the, the bystander that found him that we need to sort of focus our attention on. So we just make sure that he's OK and we'll go from there. Hey, mate, how you going? What's your name? Gary, mate. Gary, my name's Blake and this yeah, is Paul. Mate. Yeah, good. How are you, mate? Yeah, mate, I'm a bit shaken up, mate. Yeah? You know, I, I can't believe you saw the passed away, mate. Yeah. He's a friend of yours, is he? Yeah, mate. I've known him for nearly 20 years, mate. Yeah. yeah. I, I should have realised, you know, this morning, but I just it didn't click. You know? I thought he was having a slow. Yeah, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Has he been well? Has he been healthy? No, he's been sick, mate. Oh, yeah. has he? Yeah, okay. but I didn't expect to find him, you know, on a Monday. Yeah. yeah. As a former lifeguard, it's not the first time Blake has seen a dead body. But the situation is never easy. More so for friends and family. I guess it's quite difficult to see people in um, in, in these situations of grief. Like that, the poor old fella. Yeah. yeah. So look, if you need to talk to someone about it, no, I'm fine, mate. Yeah, yeah. this way. Yeah. 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 No worries. You, you While Paul say. helps police, Blake comforts neighbours. They have just heard the news. Kylie, my name's Blake. Kylie and her mum are among Frankie's closest friends. Well, what do you say to someone in that situation? What, what can you possibly do to help that person? You, you really want to help that person, but what could I possibly say or do in that situation to, um, to help those people? And I think that was probably the hardest part about that job. <laughs> they got very upset. And yeah, that can be confronting for a young fella, uh, but I thought he handled it pretty well. I don't think it's something that you can be trained in in your eight weeks at Roselle. It's something that you can get trained in over, over your career, I guess, how to try and address people that are affected by these situations. In Sydney, John and mentor Jordan have been called to an inner city apartment block. We've just been called to a 35-year-old female who's apparently drug-affected and um, potentially quite aggressive, so the police have uh, spotted us on the way to the job and they're coming to give us a hand. We've got to go inside and try and find out what she's taken and see exactly what's going on. Paramedics are often at risk of being assaulted by drug or alcohol-affected patients. Police escort Jordan and John onto the premises. Police escort trainee John and mentor Jordan Police. to a reported drug overdose. The patient is conscious but distressed. Have you been well lately or...? You have, you haven't been sick at all. I'm just going to take your temperature. The 21-year-old woman lives on her own. Paramedics learn she has a history of mental illness and sexual abuse. You're going to be all right, OK? Take your temperature. John takes the woman's temperature. Jordan's four years of experience kick in. So just tell me, did you start feeling sick after you smoked the bong? Or you were feeling sick coughing. before that? Yeah, I was coughing before that. You were coughing before that, were you? OK. Just relax this arm for a sec while John does your blood pressure. Please, I feel We're just going to monitor. Essentially, most of her vital signs are normal, except her heart rate's a bit up and her breathing rate's a bit up. I don't really know if it's to do with the cannabis at all. Um, I think she's... You know, got some other personal issues going on and perhaps the cannabis has caused her to feel very unwell. It certainly, cannabis can certainly make you very anxious. Hold on to that. <coughs> I'll give you something to settle down the vomiting, OK? You're all right, doll. An injection can help relieve the woman's nausea. Sweetheart, can I just get your shoulder out for a tick and I'm going to give you this... Mm -mm injection of Maxalon, OK, and that'll stop the vomiting. No, I don't want needles. I don't want needles. I don't care how sick I am. I know, but listen to me. This one, it's just in your no, arm. It's, it's really quick. Do you hate needles? It's a you? new dimension of the job for me to see a patient that is strongly resisting any treatment we're trying to give them when it's just going to be for their greater good. Listen, you're a tough girl. It's not going to hurt that much. Yeah. 
You can hold someone's hand. No, no, listen, no, do listen, this. listen. It's not gonna hurt. It's gonna be a little sting. Tough. Please, please. Listen. No. <laughs> it's all right, sweetie. Yeah. It's gonna be really quick, okay? Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah. Listen, nice yeah. and still with your arms. It's all right. It's all right, doll. That's all, okay? It's gonna stop that vomiting. It's all right. You're okay. The woman may have other drugs in her system. She will go to hospital for tests and psychiatric care. I think all we can do is really support her and, and get her as comfortable as we can on the way down. We've given her medication to make to relieve the nausea, or at least try to. Just seeing this stuff for the first time and dealing with it on the street is very different to the classroom environment. And you can have the best training in the world and it doesn't prepare you for seeing and doing this stuff on the street. It's been ingrained in my mind always to never forget that it's not really always the person's fault as to how they've ended up there and not, never to judge them. That's just who they are. It doesn't determine the level of care or the amount of care they get. You treat them as, as anyone you'd be going to. In Coffs Harbour, Recruit Blake is getting a tour of his new home with Mentor Paul. Just up Coffs Harbour's renowned for its bananas, of which I believe you're a lover. Oh, I love them. Yeah. Breakfast, lunch and dinner. The bigger the better up here, mate. I actually can't stand bananas. I grew up in an area where there was a lot of bananas and mangoes on my property, and I think I was force-fed one too many bananas and mangoes, and I don't really like bananas. But Blake's tour is about to come to an abrupt end. And what did they say happened? Someone's been stabbed. Mother has possibly been stabbed lying on the ground bleeding. Um, so we've been called to a, a stabbing. Um, no further details uh, at this stage. Blake has never attended a stabbing. Paramedics are at the scene before police. They have no idea how volatile the situation may be. Then, the perpetrator makes a surprise appearance. From what I understand, she sent a message to a friend saying that she's killed her mother and that she was lying on the floor. Um, and. Uh, the friend in Brisbane's uh, apparently taken that literally, and um, and here we are. I didn't think she, he's going to call the police. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah, but you just yeah. If you send things like that, people don't know whether it's true or not. And if it's true, well, obviously they're concerned about you. No, so, I didn't know Nina. That's I, right. I thought I was joking. Yeah. It's okay. April. Everyone lies with it. Is that right? April Fool's Day was nine days earlier. The 18-year-old's practical joke has distracted paramedics and police from real cases. Prank emergency calls can attract serious fines. The joke may soon be on her. Not really what I expected for my first stabbing call, but probably a far better outcome for, for everyone involved than, um, than if someone had have actually been stabbed. Coming up... Fuel and fire are a dangerous combination. Danny attends a shocking Burns case. Thinking, oh my God. Just push against my hand as high as you can. Fantastic. After graduating in hometown Sydney, former bookseller Danny has just been assigned to the country. Seems pretty quiet. Definitely not something I'm used to. Musselbrook, population 11,000. No, it's got a lot of charm. Uh, the secret ingredients, lemonade. Yeah, it's got to be cold, it's got to be short. Don't know why. So Life in the bush, with tea and scones on the menu. I don't think this would be happening in any of the city stations. Oh, they're good, dude. So hold it in your right hand, pour okay. it with your left. Out here, paramedics work in the wide open spaces and often require helicopter support. I really hope this isn't toxic. <laughs> it's a weekday just days into Danny's new posting. With mentor Tony, she's been called to a burns victim 45 minutes drive from base. Oh my God. 
Getting out of the ambulance, I saw the burn site before I even saw the patient, and the site didn't look too good. There was scorched grass. It was behind a tanker. I had no idea what was in the tanker, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, how bad is this going to be? Paramedics from nearby Cessnock arrived minutes earlier and scooped up the injured worker. Pants of cord light. Yep, yep. Um, taking his pants off his pants of cord light. Yeah. Okay. Basically stuck Bob, a council worker, has severe burns to his lower legs. He was using a naked flame next to volatile fuels in tinder dry grass. Got into the grass and yeah, way it went from there, and, and then it caught onto my trousers, which I didn't sort of realise. And... Third degree burns have penetrated deep into Bob's flesh. They pose a serious risk of infection. So they're um and ah arguing about the helicopter. Do you think we need it? Um, look, I don't you th know. You think in full thickness? I'm thinking, yeah. Okay. The more immediate concern is shock. Paramedics decide to evacuate Bob by chopper. I'm just looking at his stats and his pulse, and they're both looking great. Yeah, they look pretty damn well. <laughs> okay, so yeah. Danny's crew take Bob to a nearby oval so that will serve as a helipad. How's the plane? So good, yeah. Under control. It's Danny's first experience working with a chopper crew in a medical emergency. I got to see how that all handles and that was a good experience. One, two, three. <laughs> Bob's burns were so severe, he spent a month in the John Hunter Hospital. get a bit down hearing what other classmates are getting their hands into, but lifting a patient all together and working as a team. The people you, you've only met for, you know, a couple of seconds, really. It's really cool. Next time on Recruits, Saturday night in the city, a victim of excess or something else. I don't know what was put in that drink that that guy bought you. Blake on the front line. His first cardiac arrest. I've never done CPR before. It's it's a little um, intimidating. And a driver in shock after a five-car pileup. You need to open your eyes, okay? Open your eyes. And for more recruits action, log on to the website. <laughs>